Chaudhary. So, hello everybody, welcome back to another episode. I'm back with a wonderful episode with Angela Roy. Angela Roy is an educator, a teacher, and runs a, a, a school, a play school for children in uh, Bengaluru. And also, uh, I know her as the president of AFS. Uh, a lot of people who you see my videos and have been my followers for a long time would know AFS. So she is the president of it and of press uh, of India. So yeah, thank you very very much, Angela, ma'am. Thank you very much for joining in. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lakshit, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. Yes, ma'am. So before we get into any conversation, that would be great if you could introduce yourself, what you do, and all of that. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, I am Angela Roy. I am an early childhood educator. Uh, this was a passion for many, many years. So I mastered in child development. My specialization is with children in the age group of two to five. But uh, in my role as a teacher, an active teacher for about 30 years uh, with little children and running my own uh, preschool where I could, uh, you know, uh, do some of the things that I really wanted to do. So most of what I uh, have to say will be based on experiences that uh, I have had with little children. And then, of course, my role in AFS as the chairperson of AFS India and the president of AFS Asia Pacific is that I deal again with children, but not so little children. <laughs> so they're still children to me, Lakshit. They are your yeah. age group and uh, younger and sometimes perhaps even a little older. But it's a pleasure to be able to deal with the two because for me, it's an important connection. I always tell people that what happens in preschool oftentimes impacts what happens in high school. It's very, very important to have uh, an, you know, an excellent early childhood experience, an excellent uh, preschool experience if uh, you want to have a very good high school experience. So uh, dealing with these two age groups really helps me to connect the two. So that's, yes. that's my introduction. I'm at heart a teacher. I love to teach. I love to train. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, and have been doing for many years yeah great great thank you very much ma'am so uh, yeah. as a as a you know when you when you uh, are a teacher who deals with uh, students and teachers and helps students from two to uh, five how how does it change like how has it you know in the experience of yours in 30 years how has teaching changed for you See, earlier it was just that uh, children would come perhaps to play and play was not given the importance that uh, it needs to be given because a lot of things uh, happen during play. A lot of learning happens, right? So now people talk of learning through play and things like that, but these were these were so natural, especially in India. And children were learning to play. While playing, they learned to share and care. They learned to give and take. Uh, while play, they develop various emotional uh, skills, you know, and uh, social skills. So playing and uh, early childhood education as it started was basically you go to a safe, secure, happy environment away from home, somewhere where you feel comfortable and uh, there are adults that you suddenly feel comfortable with, some uh, mother figures or maybe even a grandmother figure if you take uh, me and the child is happy to leave home and go there. And while there, then three hours or so uh, passes with uh, various uh, play-related activity. Now there are a lot of buzzwords going around, uh, you know, with regards to early childhood and what you should be doing with uh, little children. But I think the most important thing, which was and which is and which always should be, is that the child has to feel safe, secure, comfortable, happy, 
And when those are addressed, then learning does happen. It can't be forced on them. It happens and we have to just facilitate it by, you know, being around and providing various things. So I think this would be how, what I have seen and I uh, sort of stuck to uh, what I call always going back to the drawing board and always relooking and uh, trying to see how to keep it simple. Keep it simple, but keep it meaningful. So yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And like, for example, uh, you know, you we are in 2021 right now. When you say 30 years, mm-hmm. you've been teaching. So the first 10 years before technology and everything became a hype or came into, you know, really, really mainstream. How were those 10 years of you teaching before, before 20, 2000s coming in? They were simply excellent. And they those are the years that have to be brought back. Because children don't ask for technology. They don't need technology. We want them to be adept at it. And that's why we use it. But in my school, I was very, very particular, Lakshit, right through. There was a huge blackboard the size of a wall. There was colored chalk, which uh, was attractive for them. Uh, Of course, they have to be watched because that chalk could look like something very pleasant and edible, (laughs) but (laughs) using blackboard and chalk, uh, no computers, no TV, rather storytelling, uh, showing them storybooks with huge pictures in it. You know, these things, I was able to capture their attention. And uh, I think this is, these are the valuable things. We do not need computers and we do not need uh, you know, whiteboard and any other thing, when you're dealing with this particular age group, they ask for so little. I once gave a small piece of white uh, string, you know, like a piece of twine. I left it with three two-year-olds and I was watching to see what they do. They kept themselves engaged with that little piece of string for a long, long time. So, This is what it is. If you ask me, those first 10 years were lovely. I tried to replicate that for the next uh, several years and I've kept it that way. Yeah, totally. Wonderful. Wonderful now. Yeah. 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 And uh, and because of COVID and all of that coming in, how has teaching changed in past 1.5 years? It has changed terribly. For me, it was a complete uh, close down. I closed down and I haven't opened because it is not worth risking, uh, you know, the health of these uh, little kids and little kids can be carriers. Therefore, it impacts the adults who work with them. And then the cycle goes on. It never ends. So I uh, perhaps in uh, Bangalore, I was the first to uh, close in March of last year as soon as it was announced. So it has become tough because now teachers uh, do online. I do no online teaching because for me, I uh, must have that touch and feel factor of having the children with me in the room. So uh, singing nursery rhymes to them on the screen and reading stories to them on the screen uh, just isn't my way. This is my very uh, personal opinion, Lakshit, so it doesn't hold good for others, but uh, you know, this is what it is. It has impacted teachers, parents, and children a lot, this whole lockdown thing. And therefore, teachers have to be more creative, more in- innovative in doing it online. Uh, parents want their children to be engaged. And the kids have to be told to sit and, you know, still and listen and look. Yeah. They do it. Their attention span is five minutes, maybe if you're lucky, 10 minutes. Yeah. but that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is okay. difficult. Yeah. 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 So um thank you for thank you very much for bringing that and sharing that up ma'am and um, yeah I think everything you told did mean uh, rightly and yeah. So now I want to move towards some of the questions I had to and the topic we had dis- we decided for this session uh, mm-hmm. is inclusivity in classrooms let it be in in terms of say gender race and all of the different various sectors and um, mm-hmm. divisions in the society so 
first question I would like to put up here is what does inclu- inclusivity means to you? How do you think and what is inclusivity in classrooms? Oh, inclusivity uh, means a lot to me, uh, Lakshit. It would, uh, it would really mean the world to me because uh, to me, uh, what is inclusivity in a classroom? It is a classroom full of bright-eyed little children, mm-hmm. all shapes, sizes, and colors, playing together happily. They're having fun together. They're playing. They're not really conscious of uh, how they look. You know. Now this is the this is what shall I say? That's the utopian idea of having a classroom like that, a homogeneous one. But inclusivity in the classroom is, it is hugely important. And I say this because children are never too young to learn. They are always learning from the earliest age onwards. Uh, We adults will use all those cliches that, uh, you know, children are sponges, they can absorb everything. What we forget is that they also observe everything. Mm. And they are capable of observing when we adults don't think that they are. Mm. So Mm. we tend to think that they are in the room, but they're not, you know, paying attention, not listening. They're busy, whatever it is, building blocks or playing with their toys. But there they are observing and then absorbing it all. So we have to be very careful what we uh, talk in front of them and how we behave in front of them because uh, we have to apply this to them and very conscientiously nurture a culture of uh, inclusivity with them. And if we do this, I feel very strongly about this Lakshit and I have tried so hard in my school to make it inclusive that because I feel by you know being uh, inclusive, you can at a very young age bring up a generation of uh, loving, caring, uh, you know, giving, forgiving, tolerant, accepting, adjusting, and all those things, human beings. This is how you have to sow, or rather we have to sow the seeds at a very early age. So this is what inclusivity means to me. And I just think it's... uh, it is extremely important even at this tiny age. Yeah, totally. And I also agree to that point that children absorb and observe the, both the things yeah. together. Because, uh, you know, we we, we, we use, uh, parents use, you know, bad words and all of those words. And they, mm-hmm. they are like, yeah, yeah please, please don't you use it in front of the child. He will get a bad thing. But then they don't mm-hmm. understand that you know, their children get it too. They get it from their parents. And we uh, p- people want, you know, there are a lot of parents who want their children to be clean, their children to eat properly, uh, their children to do things where, like, you know, cleaner way. But their parents are not the way they want their children to be. And they accept it. They, they expect that the child is like them, like the way they want to, you know, have the child. So that, mm-hmm. that's very rightly said. And I agree totally on that point that child and children do observe also what people are doing around them. So yeah, totally, totally agree to that point. And uh, before getting into the next question, I would like to just to put up a question here. Mm-hmm. Do you think um, homeschooling is a way of taking care of a child in a proper way and nurturing, you know, sowing a very clean, I'm not putting the word clean, but sowing a seed which is going to be giving you good fruits when they grow up? Not necessarily. See, in the early days, uh, let's let's look at India. We had a very nice, strong joint family system. We had a joint family system, which means that there was always someone to take care of the young child. You didn't have to look for preschool or daycare, right? Now, in that family, there were perhaps, uh, there were kids who could play with the child. Uh, There were aunties and uncles who could give the child a bath in case the mother was busy or had gone out somewhere. Uh, There were grandmothers who could tell stories to the child. So everything really that we want to do in preschool was happening without realizing it 
in that kind of a setup. But once that ended, of course, parents needed a safe haven to uh, leave their children. And uh, that's how we needed preschools and we needed daycares. So it is, uh, it is so important, therefore, that the daycare or the preschool becomes a home away from home. I'm very, uh, very, you know, insistent on that. It has to be a home away from home. home yeah. It has to look like a home as much as possible. So we, I have run it from home and it has looked like a home. home. And they always think that, okay, I'm going from home to Auntie Angela's place to, uh, you know, uh, play. Yeah, or totally. have fun. And, and, and uh, can't agree more because I've had a chance to see a home and it's it's like home, it is home and <laughs> beautifully made. Yes, totally, totally agree on that point, ma'am. Thank you very much. So yeah. moving um, <laughs> so putting the next question up, so do you think uh, it's possible for teachers to be inclusive and how do you think they can be inclusive in the class? If yes, how? Oh, if no, then how? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, I, I definitely have a longish answer Lakshit, because like I said, I'm telling you things that I have done. So it's not just some theoretical thing. I'm telling you from actual experience, right? Yes. Now, teachers, how can a teacher have an inclusive classroom? One is seating, mm -hmm. seating arrangement. So if it is uh, a school where there are girls and boys, then of course, uh, you definitely don't want to segregate on the basis of uh, gender. So you seat them uh, for if, uh, you know, they are playing, say, you pair them, you can pair them. And there you are getting rid of various, uh, what shall I say, biases. You don't bifurcate, you know, mm -hmm. you will pair them. Uh, so that they play and it's just natural for them to be. I'll go yeah. more into that as I go along. Uh, you choose toys that uh, are not gender specific. Mm -hmm. So this thing that girls play with dolls and boys play with cars, we, uh, we need to get over that. Why should uh, I like the girls to play with cars? Because one day I expect them to be driving and I like the boys to play with dolls because one day they'll be helping their wives to you know, take care of their babies. So this is how I see it even as young as they are. And uh, of course, including a lot of song, dance, uh, drama uh, in the daily curriculum because nothing works better than a little role play. Believe me, to drive home a point role play rather than just trying to sit them down and tell them something this drives the point home but uh, this inclusivity uh, lakshit i must say has to be a three pronged approach mm -hmm. it's the teacher the parent uh, then of course the child if we do not have the parents on board with us then the teachers efforts are uh, fairly futile you must have the parents on board, they have to understand what you're trying to do there and why you do it, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll give you a little more examples of, you know, when if suppose there's gender, uh, you want to do gender inclusivity, mm -hmm. then like I said, you don't separate the boys and the girls, you let them be together. Yeah. And you don't give these gender specific toys. Suppose it's a race that you're addressing. Mm -hmm. How do you include uh, race into this whole inclusivity thing. Yeah. Then you teach songs from around the world and perhaps in different languages. And some of these languages may sound funny and the child ends up laughing. Nothing works better than humor with little children. So you teach them songs from around the world. Uh, my favorite is my uh, little, uh, you know, baby uh, map. And I'll show them where this is from and you know this is so far away from India and things like that. Then you act plays where the characters look different, you know. They have different hair color, different eye color, different skin color. You can have plays like that. Uh, caste, creed and religion are uh, 
not so visible when you uh, see little children together, but one way of inclusivity is you celebrate all festivals. Every festival we have celebrated in our school with, you know, allotting perhaps that whole day goes towards that. There is decorating and then there is actually celebrating and then there is explaining at uh, baby level to them about these festivals and encouraging the children must come dressed in all those outfits. And when casting characters in the play, uh, Lakshit, I would be very careful uh, not to say, not to cast a Christian child as Mother Mary or a Hindu child as Goddess Lakshmi or a little Hindu boy as uh, Krishna. You know, I would always make sure that it was a child from some other religion. And that's why we need the parents on board. They have to see, you know, the larger picture that uh, we are trying to do here. When it comes to status, this is a tricky one because uh, children don't really understand status, but they love to say that uh, my father has a big car. Mm. And, uh, you know, um, it's uh, whatever. Sometimes they even know the names. My father has a Mercedes and something. And what about the little ones that uh, whose father has a cycle? You know, so here it is very, very important. And, you know, in our school, we've always had 20% of the seats for definitely for those who couldn't afford to pay. They were educated free of cost, absolutely free of cost, books, uniform, everything free. And uh, they didn't look any different from the others. But the way to sensitize the children was to tell them that. Look, even, uh, you know, whoever was the, the helper in school, the helpers, the aunties that we called them, everyone was auntie. I was auntie Angela and the others were auntie Pushpa and auntie Sumati and auntie whatever. And the thing was to tell them that even that auntie is somebody's mommy and your driver is somebody's daddy. So, you know, that's how status was sort of... Uh, brought about and this is how teachers can bring inclusivity into the classroom mm -hmm. yeah totally, I, totally. Mean, I can go on but i will stop <laughs> <laughs> no no worries no. it was great that you uh, came up with this and so when a kid at a at a very small age when he's thought that every religion is same and everyone is similar with of course your own uh, unique talents and different uh various things you like or dislike and all of that um, what what does it look like when a kid is understanding and agreeing to the point and everybody is accepting themselves as one? You know, they at that age, uh, Lakshit, they, uh, they just are having a good time. So they are, they are listening to it, they are looking at it, they are thinking about it, but we have never had uh, not one single incident where they did not feel part of the group or they didn't want to be, you know. Everybody was celebrating every festival all together with a lot of fun. We perhaps are, were sowing the seeds of these various things that all religions are one and everything, you know, leads to the same uh, place. But... Uh, I think the, to sort of measure it, if I can say, with a kind of a feedback from them, that age is too young. But by six, say when they go to class one and they are six years old, and uh, even up till uh, they are eight, because brain development goes on till the age of eight, that's when they can perhaps process this a little uh, better and understand that, okay, in my home, uh, this is the pujas we do and in somebody else's home, that is what they do. But at the end of the day, we come to school, we're sitting in class and we all are one. It's hard to, it is hard to measure at that very early age. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Okay. 
great but and they are accepting let me just say that they are very 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 accepting at that tender age so mm -hmm. that's why i say we have to sow the seeds so the seeds that's not the age sow the seeds and then what happens with it we'll see later on see later yeah? totally totally yeah. ma'am <laughs> So um, yeah. my next question here, I would like to put up here is, uh, what, are, what are some stereotypes um, about the early childhood education in India and opposed to other various countries all around the world? Uh, I don't know if uh, it's, a, it's a comparative thing, uh, Lakshit, but I'll tell you there are certain uh, stereotypes definitely even till today. The first one is that uh, early childhood care and education, ECCE, right, mm -hmm. is only for women. This is the first thing. Okay. okay. That it's only for women. So if you were to ask me how many men are in early childhood education, and I'm talking of teachers, I'm not talking of people who own schools and who own franchises. A lot of them are men. So I'm talking of how many preschool teachers do you know or have you seen who are men? This is not a field men get into. So that's a stereotype that it is only for women. Why should it not be for men? Uh, you know, I can't uh, quote the, the, the specific research to you, but uh, contrary to what we believe child's uh, first teacher is father and that's how mothers feel bad that I'm you know I spend all day slaving over you and then as soon as uh, daddy comes home everything is about papa and papa, papa. You know. yeah but uh, men are not uh, getting into teaching early childhood education so that's a stereotype that it's only for women then uh, the other stereotype is that anyone can do it. Anyone can be an early childhood educator. You can, uh, you know, you don't need any special training or special education. This again is contrary to what I believe and I uh, believe very strongly that you must have the specific training for it because if not, at that very tender, tender age, you can be doing more harm than good mm -hmm. with all your best intentions. You may be thinking that you're doing an excellent job with these very little children, where in fact you could be doing harm. And then as they grow, you know, unlearning something is much more difficult than learning it. So it is very important that people who are in this field need to be definitely uh, trained and, you know, suitably educated. And, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the other sort of, uh, what shall I say, stereotype is that uh, in India, this is very specific to us in India, that we are good parents only if we spoon feed our children. children. And spoon feed means literally feeding them, putting balls of rice and uh, dal into their mouth, even at an older age. We spoon feed them, we have to dress them, we have to do everything for them, then we are a good parent. And uh, so conversely, if you let the child eat by himself and he's spilling half the food and eating half of it, you're quite an uncaring mother. mother. And this generally, these comments come from the older generation, the grandparents. Uh, not necessarily in-laws, maybe even the parents themselves who say that uh, this is not correct parenting mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, whatever Angela Roy is telling you there in these parenting talks is uh, quite utter nonsense, but <laughs> you need to look after your child a little better. You've got to feed the child. Don't let him button his own shirt. He can't. So, you know, you do it. For him put his shoes and socks on so what happens then is that we are just rearing a, a, a generation who don't have confidence in doing things by themselves right so these are some of the uh, stereotypical things that happen in early childhood luxury mm -hmm. 
totally totally so uh, i think these are the questions i had ma'am if you would like to add mm-hmm. anything before we get moved towards the end uh, would be really glad to hear yeah over to you okay. i think i have a i would have a small uh, message for uh, teachers who enter this uh, you know uh, this field oh i also just before i get there uh, lakshit i want to touch on one thing you know Uh, we didn't talk about uh, special education versus inclusive education right yeah and i have yeah i have some views on that which i would like to share please with please you ma'am. you know my uh, my masters degree papers a lot of them were on special education so i have every uh, what shall i say every uh, concern about uh, special ed for children but when it comes to including that into a regular classroom and like we have a lot of integrated uh, classrooms here i have some views these are purely purely personal my views but i stand by them for reasons that i uh, i'm going to say you know special children are special because they need their needs are different you know they have special needs now when they require that different care and different attention and we uh, implant them into a regular classroom the teacher is at tremendous uh, stress and strain mm-hmm. the child the special child is under stress yeah. and so are the other normal children okay the teacher has got to see that this one child gets that special care and attention while uh, minding the other 40 plus or 50 plus that she has in her classroom and at the end of the day she is answerable to the principal and the principal is answerable to the management and so it goes on so left there is this special child not really getting the care attention and that he or she needs mm-hmm. so what my uh, uh, what shall i say my little experiments that used to happen in this regard is to have a uh, special children meet the regular normal so called normal children mm-hmm. at certain uh, classes say you can have a joint art class drawing and coloring class or you can meet at uh, dance or you can meet at uh, gardening or at craft or something where beforehand you have to sensitize the normal children mm-hmm. to the special children who are going yeah. to be yeah. coming in they look different behave different and you need to be kind and caring and we have found that our children used to be very very kind caring and everyone gravitating towards that child and you know trying to nurture them so this is something i i wanted to touch on that it, in my view it's not ideal to have them in the classroom but then that's how i feel about it but we have to put them together preparing both sides for yeah. this thing mm-hmm. so finally my message to uh, early childhood educators and you know teachers of very little children is that uh, you have to love what you do if you're not loving it something is wrong please don't do it you have to love you have to wake up every day wanting to do this and if you like it so much then do it and if not look for some other field okay you must also remember that for the few hours the child is there with us we are taking the place of the mother, mother. so we've got to have that you have to have that motherly instinct or in my case the grandmotherly instinct to have that child with us for those 3 hours and the child must feel it and believe me children can tell uh, early childhood educators have to constantly learn upgrade their skills they mm-hmm. have to be at it all the time learning never ends for any of us right. at any time and then finally take care of yourself take care of yourself i'm always very pleased to uh, uh, to quote james baldwin who said that uh, 
children have never been good at listening to their parents, but they have never failed to imitate them. Yes. So this holds good for teachers too. You need to take care of yourself. How much me time are you giving yourself? Are you eating right, sleeping right, exercising right? If you are not healthy in body, mind and spirit, how are you going to take care of these very tender lives, you know? So take care of yourself, love yourself first and love all children equally and love what you do. That's it. Totally. Okay. So thank you very, very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for joining a wonderful mm -hmm. session about a lot of different topics and about different things I you covered up. And yeah. um, thank you very much for taking your time out. This is wonderful. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Lakshit. Thank you so much.